Okay. Okay, so welcome everyone to this keynote, keynote conversation. Um, I see that the picture has changed. The, the, the picture on the program and the one that was up there this morning was somebody with climate justice now on, written on their back as a slogan. Well, this is the, so th this is the uh, a session on, uh, on climate justice now. So formally, environment, sorry, um, environmental justice and climate governance. Um, so we, we have uh, uh, two, two, two speakers, Robin Eckersley and Maxine Burkett. And so Robin will go first. Um, Robin is, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, a distinguished uh, a green political theorist, theorist um, no, uh, notable for her books, um, amongst others, on, um, on the green state. And uh, has, has worked um, also extensively on, uh, on, on, on global environmental governance. So Robin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, John. The afternoon um, session we have here is one about climate justice or environmental justice and governance. And I'm going to focus on climate justice. And um, I think Maxine is also having that focus as well. So in keeping with the theme of looking back and looking forward, I'm going to briefly look back over the international climate negotiations to see what we've learned about climate justice and to carry forward some of those lessons in thinking about how we can strategize, and I'm thinking about how the climate justice movement to th can think about governance and how it can strategize around um, constructing governance. So what can we say about the history of climate negotiations? Um, I'm one who sees the Paris Agreement as a breakthrough. I was there, I had tears in my eyes, it was like Woodstock, we were hugging each other. We'd been following it for so long, we never thought this would happen. Um, and it's certainly better than the counterfactual, and we have 1.5 degrees in there, but I'm not kidding myself that we're heading anywhere in the right direction. Most of the academic research on climate justice um, has influenced NGOs and it's influenced some of the negotiating positions of some of the parties, but it's had zilch influence on actual agreements reach, whether it be the Kyoto Protocol, the Copenhagen Accord, which was adopted in 2010, and of course the Paris Agreement. And yet we've seen increasingly refined arguments about climate justice, focusing mainly on the distribution of the burden of mitigation. What we see is now an increasing consensus that there's room for disagreement here, room for reasonable disagreement, because there's so much slippage between those who are causally responsible, those who may be culpable, and those that have the capability to actually address the problem. And it's that slippage down the line that makes it so difficult to come up with any neat kind of solution. And if you turn to the negotiations themselves, here we have unreasonable disagreement and a great deal of bad faith in the debates about the interpretation of equity and common but differentiated responsibilities and respective um, capacities. The gold standard of science setting the, um, the objectives in terms of telling us what dangerous climate change is or telling us what different degrees of warming will do reaching a really precautionary approach and then allocating emission reduction targets according to uh, an agreed formula of CBDR, of course, was never going to happen. So what we have now, of course, is, is do-it-yourself um, climate policy, nationally determined contributions. The parties have not resolved the deep disagreements that have plagued the negotiations for more than a quarter of a century. They've bypassed them. But I don't think it's that much different to the Kyoto Protocol, and I was talking to Chucks earlier. I have a real problem with this distinction between top-down and bottom-up. It sticks in my craw for various reasons. Kyoto was not top-down. It was bargaining in 1997 where parties put on the table commitments they felt they could manage, and if they weren't accepted, they'd walk away. That's certainly what Australia did with its 108% target. So this was no application of CBDR, and it wasn't top-down at all. It was just successful bargains by parties. And what we have now is actually not that different. The only difference is that it's less punitive. So it makes it sound better. So if you look at the way the, um, 
the State Department of the US was defending the Copenhagen model. This was before Durban. It was always bad Kyoto, good Copenhagen. And they had this grid where they were showing all the things that were bad about one and good about the other. And the bottom-up language made it sound democratic and flexible and wholesome. But it's nothing like that. What was interesting in Lima, which is the penultimate COP before um, Paris, um, most environmental NGOs were celebrating get to get a provision in the, clima, the, the Lima call for climate action that all the parties had to defend the fairness and ambition of what were then called intended nationally determined contributions. And as they rolled in during 2015 in the lead up to Paris, as we read them as they came in, they were woeful, completely woeful. There was a couple that tried to really go far, like Switzerland, actually discuss the climate literature, acknowledge there was reasonable basis for disagreement, and actually did not a fair job, although Swiss NGOs said it was problematic. And their 2030 target was minus 50%, but most other countries um, didn't do much. India and China wrote very interesting ones that went on and on in their preface about who they were, what sort of responsibility they were taking. The Indian one talked about Gandhi, the virtues of yoga, um, and then eventually got on to talk about some of its solar initiatives without, of course, mentioning its ongoing commitment to coal. So there was a lot of bad faith all round. So, and of course, we now have the Trump effect, which, although the, the dominant narrative is that everyone's rallying around and it just proves how, how um, what a draw card the Paris Agreement is, the fact that Trump's reneging on the final two-thirds tranche of the US's climate finance commitment means that many developing countries that made their indices dependent on adequate finance have now a good argument to walk away or to revise their NDC downward, which is something the US is already considering. So the momentum is already starting to, to, to stall a little bit. Nonetheless, one thing seems to come through, despite all the disagreement, whether it's reasonable or otherwise, is no one can deny the triple whammy injustice that everyone cites that the most vulnerable countries and communities in the world are the least responsible for causing the problem and the least capable of adapting. Everyone nods their head. For some, it's a call to arms almost. For others, it's just something to regret. But no one can dispute the fact that that is a potent injustice, overdetermined, triply layered. And I want to hold on to that thought and come back to it because there is a convergence around there that I think really, really needs to be the primary focus, I think, of the climate justice movement going forward. Because if you can address the needs of the most vulnerable, everyone else is going to be better off too. Now, most of the debates, as I mentioned, about climate justice and allocating the burden of mitigation, I think now we're shifting. It's not so much a burden to be avoided as an opportunity to be seized. And so there is an interesting discursive shift there. But most of it has been about distributive justice. Now, we've got some fine environmental justice theorists in the room that have widened the language and framework of justice to include recognition and participation or procedural justice. There are, of course, other dimensions too, like corrective justice. And here, though, it, it's a mixed bag, and I, this is what I want to ponder. Corrective justice is obviously backward-looking, and there's some say, no, we must be forward-looking. But Ulrich Beck said that well, actually, I'll start with Iris Marion Young. She critiqued what she called the liability model when it comes to structural injustices. Because the liability model picks up a liberal moral ontology that tries to find guilty individual parties who are culpable. And once you've found them, everyone else is kind of absolved and it deflects attention from the structural nature of these just injustices. And Ulrich Beck, um, said the same thing, and he said these structural injustices are generating global risks that are uninsurable, which I think is a real problem. But in trying to address this problem, vulnerability stands in an inverse relationship to capability, and those most capable to address these problems are completely spooked by the fact that many of these risks are almost uninsurable. I think this is the challenge. This is right there the challenge, the political challenge. I think we can make this insurable, and so I'm going to now turn a little bit and talk about the Warsaw Mechanism, which is, again, a woeful attempt to try and address these issues with loss and damage. But before I do, there's one more area of climate justice or dimension of justice that we've not really looked at much. And Sonia Klinsky has talked about maybe thinking about trans, um, transitional justice. Now, most of us probably think, oh, yeah, just transition. 
communities moving away from fossil fuel. Yeah, we understand what that is. But I think it's got a lot more um, potential as, as a way of thinking about justice that can encompass all the different dimensions that I've already mentioned, that can be both backward-looking and forward-looking, that can use the liability model judiciously as a weapon of the weak against the most capable, because that's really where the political fight is that we have to strategically focus on. Now, you might think of truth commissions, and we could probably do with a few of them at the moment in this post-truth age. But there's also amnesties, which is not something that vulnerable parties should give up if they've actually got a basis for litigation, but certainly that's a very powerful bargaining chip. But unfortunately, there's not much of a strong foothold, although in the session uh, before lunch on climate litigation, there were some really interesting ideas floated there. But transitional justice also can be very flexible. It can deal with managing profound non-economic loss. It can provide an acknowledgement of past wrongs it needs to acknowledge power imbalances, and it needs to look at this as a political process, because at the end of the day, this will happen through a political settlement across different communities and so forth. So I think that if we think about the challenge of loss and damage and include um, forced migration from climate change, international migration, then I think that we could start not through a global treaty or trying to do much with the Warsaw Mechanism, because that's such a problem. Basically, the US and the EU and other developed countries agreed to the Warsaw Mechanism in return for not having the words liability and compensation anywhere in the agreement. It's in the COP decision text, um, paragraph 51, if you want to read it. So they've pretty much wiped their hands of that, but that does not say that vulnerable countries, particularly small island developing states, don't have their legal options outside the Paris Agreement. And I've interviewed them and that they said, no, we knew we hadn't given that up. We just can't claim it through the Paris Agreement. So going forward, I think the best way to do it is through voluntary experiments, where you have a kind of transitional justice in the sense that you have to think about forced movements of peoples, and you have to think about not just the injustices generated by climate change, but the injustices generated by policy and governance attempts to address climate change. And we know that's always standing in the way of um, moving forward when we look at vested interests in fossil fuel. Um, because, you know, the elephant in the room is fossil fuel, but it's hardly mentioned in the, in the climate regime. So clearly, the interests of the vulnerable have to be um, front and centre in this. So the idea is to develop flexible accommodations. So if you think of influxes of, um, say, Pacific Islanders coming to Australia or New Zealand, start with local communities and local planning laws work out voluntary arrangements between communities, then move upwards at the state level to help organise that. Think about not apartheid communities, but communities that zoning laws, housing laws, new urban design, there's all sorts of things that actually can accommodate that, particularly for groups that want to move and stay as groups to maintain cultural cohesion and identity. Now, in a separate paper, I've made an argument about the differences between political refugees and climate refugees, and there are many, um, in the, the two most significant ones, given I'm running out of time now, are that climate refugees, for the most part, will eventually reach a point where they have to permanently stay away. Unless they build structures on their atolls and so forth, where they may want to return and also maintain their fishery rights and their exclusive economic zone and so forth. But generally speaking, it will become a diaspora. I've argued they should have a right to choose their host state. And I've argued that states should have an obligation to receive them, but you need to separate the obligation of states to contribute to a mega fund to facilitate this based on capability or ability to pay, irrespective of causal responsibility or culpability, because you need as much money as you can possibly get, whether it was um, people of countries that have benefited from climate change or not. So you're separating out the responsibility to contribute to the fund, it should be like a global super fund, like a global social insurance system that's separate and additional to the Green Climate Fund. That will ease some of the hostility of host communities who know that they're well equipped. And also, a lot of island communities might want to migrate somewhere quite close where they've got common, common cultural ties, and they may not be well-developed states. But I certainly wouldn't argue using CBDR as a basis for um, migrants to choose their host state on the basis of their culpability. That's a really bad way to start a new relationship between two communities. 
So I think to finish, and I certainly want to say some more about the Warsaw mechanism and about how one might deal with host communities and so forth, but I think we need to move from critical theory to critical problem solving. Many of you are probably aware of um, Robert Cox's famous distinction. Critical theory looks at the structural causes that generate, or the structural drivers that generate injustices or domination, and problem solving just ameliorates them while not calling into question those distinctions. But that paints critical theorists into a very awkward corner because these problems are overdetermined by multiple structures. You cannot change everything at once and you can only do that within the clinical arena um, of existing states and other communities. So it's a terrible catch-22. So we need to develop an account of critical problem solving which looks for the next best policy steps to take that have the most transform trans um, transformational value. And I think as a, it's the next phase in critical theory. It's a phase that cannot be ignored. And it requires historical research. It, needs, it looks for um, opportunities in terms of normative debates and so forth. But I think as a general orientation to thinking about these problems for a movement that hasn't had a huge number of successes on these really big questions, um, to try and think of maybe polycentric governance experiments that are, that are voluntary, that become exemplary, that can be a basis of social learning from which you may get regional solutions and possibly, ultimately, international solutions. And I'll stop there. Okay, Th thanks Robin. Now, our second speaker is uh, Maxine Burkett, who is Professor of Law at the University of Hawaii, um, well known for her work in international law, uh, climate justice, and islands in particular. So, Maxine. Thank you. Good afternoon and aloha. It's a pleasure to be here. It's actually an honor to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation to join this conversation. Um, I've learned so much already. And uh, in fact, I, I hope that um, this panel were able to tease out some of the points that Robin made and some of the perspectives that I might add, which I think um, uh, departs in some ways, but converges in some really important ways. And I would say the most um, significant way that I'm thinking about climate change is in the context of migration, the climate refugee crisis, and the notion that the sort of the speed at which it's moving, the scope of its impacts are so um, uh, monumental that we have to think differently maybe about some of our core structures. Um, in the states, some of us in the environmental law uh, professors world um, have started to take on a new term. Instead of the elephant in the room, it's the octopus in the parking garage. And that's what you're looking at right now. This is not a, a, a post-storm uh, event. This is a king tide in, in Miami Beach. And in fact, an octopus washed up into the parking garage. It was returned to the sea. But again, this is the kind of no analog circumstance that we're starting to see. So the octopus in the parking garage becomes the most important way to think about the no analog structure, but also the climate surprises that we can't anticipate. Uh, I want to talk about in my less than 10 minutes or so. Um, and one story that sort of frames all of this for me, um, the notion of climate migration, what this means for the law, I will use uh, the US, examples of migration in the US, uh, just to get to sort of illustrate where we are in the, um, the problem solving around this, which as you can imagine, very preliminary, if at all. And this notion of legal feedback mechanisms, which I'll say a little bit more about. So um, the story, when I was, uh, uh, working with the White House Council on Environmental Quality as a partner in the University of Hawaii. This is in the prior administration. Uh, we hosted a symposium in December with the Hawaii and Alaska Sea Grant College programs of the Department of Energy. Completely different political landscape, as you can imagine. But the Council on Environmental Quality had been doing pretty amazing work on preparedness. Um, probably too late, but at least something that showed a, a real uh, new direction for the Obama administration in taking climate change and migration very seriously. At that event, we had community members, we had law professors, we had policy wonks. And perhaps the most uh, arresting moment was the afternoon, um, evening, early evening keynote that we had where Foreign Minister Silk of the Republic of the Marshall Islands paused uh, tearfully and said, um, this is crazy. This is my country, my future, my people. We're contemplating um, extinction. And so it sort of set us back a little bit in thinking about what is, on one hand, a, a, a conundrum, a policy issue, uh, one in which the law needs to figure out, and the other, which is deeply uh, 
personal, deeply connected to ancestors and to notions of future generations being some literally uh, displaced. And so uh, I've had follow-on conversations with Marshallese uh, leaders as well as community members, and the questions are how much time do we have left? Um, there's some relief in the notion of maybe we destroy our coral reefs to raise our islands versus actually having to leave. These extreme trade-offs are where we are right now, and that sets a tone, I think. What we know about migration is that uh, something new has come into the, the mix. And I like to throw this slide up because it's um, showing what the drivers of migration are. And I am from Jamaica originally, and so I can attest to these sort of these different uh, ways in which one decides whether or not to move, right? There may be social reasons, there may be political drivers, there are economic drivers. I wasn't a part of the conversation when my parents had the, uh, the conversation about whether or not to move to the States. But I know that they were thinking very explicitly about labor, uh, issues, political issues, social issues. And we also have environmental drivers that's generally seen as one of those maybe five or so reasons why you leave. Um, the way I think of, of climate change is that it's not your, your mother's driver, right? It's a completely different um, uh, phenomenon. It is a change, it is a, a rate of change that's increasing. There are known unknowns and unknown unknowns that make it uh, unique. And so when we think about these kinds of statements like the maps of the world will have to be redrawn, of course, the notion here is just simply about the geography and geology of it, potentially coastal geology of it at the very least. But we have created a situation where climate change operates in a, a political world in which borders and boundaries are even more significant in some respects than the uh, physical outlay. And what we know, too, is that climate change creates different scenarios of movement. Um, I'll say a little bit about uh, the latter three, but if you think of unrest, violence, and conflict over resources as, a, as a, uh, one in which climate is associated with that move, um, oftentimes Darfur, Syria, other examples have been cited. I can say more about that later if there are questions. There's so, slow onset environmental de degradation, like um, desertification and drought that might um, induce movement. Designated prohibited areas, these are the relocation plans, which we see a lot of in the United States right now. Sudden onset disasters and then the destruction of small island states. Those five scenarios uh, will create different displacement categories. And I, I'm sharing this because I want to uh, convey just how uh, complex the scenario is. Because in each of these circumstances, there are different institutions, agencies, uh, uh, political frameworks that are operating on an individual or a community. And they all need to be coordinated. And you may not be surprised to know that we're not really uh, on the ball at this in the United States. And I sort of use an intentional uh, bit of language here. Our electorally appointed president um, has used America first to describe uh, the foreign policy, energy policy, you name it. And ironically, the first in America that are uh, grappling with the issues of climate migration, displacement and relocation are our indigenous peoples. We know that there are at least 12 communities in Alaska that are uh, formally engaged in some sort of process of relocation. There are a number more that are um, contemplating it, but there are just a, a, a dozen or so that are in the formal processes. Um, we also have in the Pacific Northwest on the Olympic Peninsula, the Quinault tribe that has a formal process for relocation that's occurring right now. You may have seen press on the uh, first official climate refugees in the US. This is the uh, Ildijon Charles, um, the Biloxi Chitamacha Choctaw tribes that are uh, uh, at this point uh, in the process of coming up with a new way of, of resettling inland um, in Louisiana. And you can see from the uh, images here that this is the result of decades of channelization for oil and gas, uh, upstream um, development that is a, a affected sedimentation downstream, and sea level rise that are coming together to uh, create a situation that's unviable. And then, of course, there's Hurricane Maria, which is such a, a massive and devastating storm uh, that showed us that uh, not only will these sort of slow-moving trains that we see in uh, coastal U.S. and in the Pacific, but fast-moving and unimaginably large ones will displace people. Similarly, the Marshall Islands, as I mentioned at the top, there is this additional issue of uh, our affiliated Pacific Islands uh, and their need to consider where to move to. Um, and we've seen some early press on this Pacific Islands exodus, which has the twin effect of both frightening people, literally, um, those that are potentially moving and those that are host communities, um, and alerting us to the change in circumstances and the move from sensitive places to other sensitive places, because Hawaii ha also has its own uh, climate forecast that's not particularly positive. <clears throat> 
So how does the law come into all of this? Well, um, David Karen, uh, who was a professor of mine, an international law uh, expert, um, had uh, written in 1990, uh, in, in a discussion about the impact of sea level rise on baselines um, about this problem of legal feedback mechanisms. And he was very purposefully uh, drawing on uh, what we understand in physical science about positive feedback loops. And uh, it was incredibly prescient given that he wrote it 27 years ago and he essentially said that legal feedbacks will not alter the amount of climate change but will aggravate the suffering that will accompany such change. The greater the change, the greater the aggravation. Uh, I would suggest, knowing what we know now 27 years later, that perhaps legal feedbacks did actually alter the amount of climate change we were not able to through um, effective policies uh, and negotiation to actually um, to limit the, the amount of emissions that we'd seen over that period of time. But it's certainly true that in the back end, there are experiences that uh, the law has, has aggravated. Um, climate migration, I think, is, is chief among them. It presents new issues. It also pulls on all of the unfinished work of our current legal regimes, namely uh, the exploitation of power, whether it's electrons or humans, uh, equity concerns and justice concerns, historical contribution to both climate change as well as other communities' abilities to respond effectively to climate change. And so far what uh, I see for the most part, not everywhere in the discourse, but for the most part there's some sort of um, paralysis or in some cases uh, benign neglect of what makes climate, climate change and climate migration different as a geopolitical and a geophysical phenomenon. Uh, and we're seeing that, um, that, that for the current legal structures have gotten us here in some respects and support that uh, continued paralysis. And there's a lot of, uh, I think, excellent research on, uh, from climate justice uh, scholars that analyze the law's structural complicity in the uneven outcomes and forecasts for the poor and of color, um, noting, just as one example, the very design of law, particularly co corporate law, that is fundamentally predisposed to environmental degradation. This is true for national trade law as well. There's also discussion about the inability to sort of clearly articulate articulate or fully, uh, uh, fully give wings, if you will, to the articulation of obligations that states have or communities have to those that are suffering disproportionately. Um, climate justice can also leverage other relevant critiques, such as those in the international migration law world in which we see that uh, migration law actively creates refugee crises by its own parameters. We also understand from climate reparations or reparations discourse generally that the theory of non-repetition is really relevant here. But few appreciate, I, uh, I think, the enormity of the task, few outside of this room, I would argue, uh, appreciate the enormity of the task to respond to no analog events that climate change migration epitomizes. And worse, we expect environmental law to do all of the work. Why? How can it? Um, according to the best estimates, uh, currently nationally determined contributions, the globe will likely experience 3.3 to 3.6 degrees Celsius temperature increase. And this would quite literally produce a whole new world. Uh, we, uh, those of you who are familiar with the ecology uh, regime and state shifts, uh, we are at a tipping point. Um, the ball is at the top of the cup. Again, there are, there's an increase in the rate of change. Uh, there are unknown unknowns out there, climate surprises, octopuses in garages. And it seems to me that a similar regime or state shift is needed for the law. And this shift does not necessarily require better environmental or international environmental law. It requires a whole new thinking about our socio-legal structures. And that's perhaps the most slippery and most unwieldy octopus in the room. Thank you. OK, thank you, Maxine. OK, we've got about um, 15 minutes or so for, for, for questions. Um, now, I'm going to ask, um, I think, perhaps just one question myself, and that will leave a bit of time for questions from the, from the audience. Um, so I'm just going to uh, uh, pick, on, pick up on uh, a couple of things that um, uh, Robin and, and Maxine said in their, um, in their talks. Um, so first, first of all, um, uh, uh, Robin noted the multiple dimensions of justice. Um, one of those dimensions is, is recognition. Now, um, small island states in particular, like the Marshall Islands, uh, are, as Maxine noted, um, quote, contemplating extinction. It's not just um, physical extinction of, of, of land, but it's also uh, the, the possibility of um, extinction of um, uh, identity as a people. And there, surely there is no, uh, there's, there's no worse example of uh, misrecognition than that possibility. 
Um, so in, in that light, um, if, if it comes to the worst, um, uh, how can host states who are re receiving force mi large waves of forced migration uh, from, by pe of migration by people who wish to maintain, retain their national identity, retain their rights of self-determination, and retain their culture. Um, how, can, uh, um, how can and should host states uh, accommodate that aspiration? So uh, Robin and, well, Robin and Maxine, who would like to go first? Thank you, John. Um, well, there's a living experiment in that about to start because the new Labour Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinta Ardern, has just announced quite recently that she's going to include a climate refugee category in their refugee intake. Now, New Zealand um, has already got a lot of Pacific Islanders who've migrated to New Zealand, so this will, this will be an interesting, um, perhaps a not too difficult state, a stage to take it. But I think these small scale sorts of experiments and the sooner the better to come in trickles is the way to manage them politically. I mean, talk to Angela Merkel when she said, we can do this to the Syrian problem. And now we've got the alternative for Deutschland um, with seats in the Bundestag for the first time since 1945. So there's a real issue here in thinking about the host state as well as the, um, uh, the diaspora group migrating. We need to acknowledge that not all those migrating necessarily want to migrate as a group. They might want to migrate as an individual. But those who do want to maintain cultural ties, and here, I should pass, pass over to you, Maxine, because you've come up with this brilliant idea of ex situ nations and a trust entity to manage, and I'll let you talk about that. That's a really creative idea. But certainly, just building on what I said in my presentation and thinking about minority rights, um, it's very important that there's a kind of partial integration and that it comes early and in small groups where you can build and learn and make sure it doesn't go in an impoverished community which is going to displace. I mean, if you look at a lot of the support for AFD in Germany, it's from the Old East where they're struggling and they see this as a real problem. So it's very important how you manage that because, as I said, when you think about climate injustice, the primary injustice are the impacts of climate change, but there are injustices on the impacts of policies to address climate change. And you have to think of those together if there's going to be a political solution. And this will be at the national level, not the international level. So developing solutions like that where you have an ability to maintain self-determination through a governing entity, but also some measure of integration where local host communities can learn, it can accommodate, and then you can build on it and the, the sky doesn't fall down. Um. Yeah, I, I think there are, uh, you know, as a member of a diaspora, I know how uh, powerful that connection can be in a, a territorialized way. So I don't need to be in Jamaica to be very proud of um, what, we, what we have produced as a, as a culture and a community. But the absence of the actual physical space, especially for communities that are so closely tied to their land, um, is, a, is an additional um, injury that we need to be very mindful of. When I was writing the XCTU, Nation XC2 article that Robin kindly referenced, um, it, it was uh, with um, a, a lot of regret and, and heavy-heartedness because the notion that you are going to create a XC2 nation is, is such a poor substitute, obviously. And I will say that as much as I think it is something we need to keep on the table because we are now in this, uh, a space of, I think, having everything left on the table as, um, as much as possible and weighing um, relative uh, value and, and cost of it, um, we need to have everything available to us, but in conversations with some of the leadership and, and, and Marshallese in particular, um, you see how we're in the space of extreme trade-offs. So some people would rather think of the most uh, environmentally destructive near-term option of, say, raising islands than to actually con contemplate leaving their islands. So it's, it's um, as, as much as that uh, is also so completely suboptimal, we need to keep that on the table. It's almost, it reminded me at least of the, the struggle um, that I think environmental justice advocates and activists after Katrina had to struggle with, which is again, these are the trade-offs. Do we allow communities to go back into these areas in New Orleans? What is the most just response? People being able to go home or us being able to say, uh, or there being a decision made uh, that, that they cannot go back home. Um, this is just happening writ large and I think we have to really 
grapple with, with it, and it's community-based, so I won't uh, presume to answer for everyone, but I do recognize that there's a struggle there with these extreme trade-offs that are just going to be more common. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's go to questions from the audience. Um, so who would like the, to ask the first question? And, okay, at the back there, and could you please um, identify yourself uh, when you ask a question? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, Billy from Fiji. I just have a, a two uh, quick comments and a very short question. Uh, firstly, thank you very much uh, for a very good uh, presentations. I wholeheartedly agree uh, with, uh, with the presenters. I think uh, the, the first uh, comment I would like to make is that uh, I do agree, yes, we small island states are the most vulnerable countries and we are not responsible for this. But I would also like to turn your attention to the great leadership the Pacific Island leaders are taking into fighting uh, uh, climate change. To myself, the real champions are like um, who the climate advocates, the climate justice advocates, are these leaders of uh, Pacific Island countries. They are taking it really, really uh, well. Uh, second uh, point, um, we are already experiencing uh, all sorts of migration within the Pacific Islands. Uh, we already move from local to local, we already move from local to region, and all of these things. And some of these migrations happened 40 years ago. It's not because of climate change, but there were people relocated from ocean islands to Fiji so that the British mining company can mine their whole land. And they were relocated, and those people until now, they are still suffering. Yes, they got a false promise, they got the land, but they cannot access to the fishing rights of the sea surrounding them. There were also people relocated from Kiribati to Solomon Islands. So it was easy during that time because of the colonial times, but there was no security of land. So those people now are still landless, the people who were relocated to Solomon Islands. So it's, it's quite very important to discuss this, and I am very happy to hear this, because the Pacific Island Forum meetings, Australia and New Zealand always try to block the issue. Whenever the islands uh, or the church or an NGOs or the countries bring this up, Australia and New Zealand always try to remove it from the agenda. But it's, I, I, am, uh, I am encouraged to hear that everyone is talking about this at this circle, so it's moving it to the next that's needed to happen. My question, um, um, uh, Professor Robin, I, I, I like the idea of creating a mega fund. I really like it so that we can start mobilizing discussion and climate refugees. I just have one worry about it. Because right now in the Pacific Island countries, they are all going how to access the Green Climate Fund, how to access the Green Climate Fund, so that we can adapt and we can mitigate at the same time. And creating this mega fund, they might say, okay, why adapting and mitigating? Let's all move to New Zealand and Australia. So just uh, food for thoughts. Thank you. Yes, no, that's a good question. Um, those of you following the minutiae of the negotiations may remember that the... Um, the original development of the Warsaw Mechanism on Loss and Damage, well, the, the idea to start negotiating that or really go forward was back in Cancun. And on the insistence of the US, it had to be part of the Cancun adaptation framework, even though you have to say this is beyond, that migration is beyond adaptation. Um, but by keeping it in the adaptation framework, then it means that the Green Climate Fund is supposed to serve the Warsaw Mechanism as well. And that's not gonna be enough. Um, the money for loss and damage is going to be greater than for mitigation and adaptation. Um, my partner, Peter Christoph, just on a big project on the climate state, and he's said that most states around the world are not putting enough money aside for mitigation, and they're not including in their budget forecasts the estimated damage costs of climate change going forward. And they're going to increasingly compete with welfare expenditure and traditional uh, um, environmental expenditure. And it's going to balloon and get absolutely huge. And so over time, this is something we need to address very early and very quickly. And it needs to be something like the Tobin tax is just the beginning of the sort of way in which we can start garnering funds for this massive global super fund. Because the Green Climate Fund, I think, should deal with... I mean, there's a crossover, you know, you can... Like a good chess game, you can do something that addresses mitigation and adaptation at the same time, and that's a good way to do it. But when you're actually forced to move, I think that's beyond adaptation. And I think that it's um, totally undeserved, 
And one other point I didn't make about the difference between climate refugees, and of course Pacific Islanders don't like that term, because they'll be just treated as second-class citizens, but those forced international climate-related migration um, is that whereas political refugees, generally speaking, the host states aren't causally implicated in their plight, it's persecution back home, there are exceptions like the Vietnam War, but here all states are causally implicated in various degrees that you can never fully disentangle, and that totally changes things, and I think therefore creates an obligation to contribute to this fund, but of course oil majors and corporations as well. Um, so I think this super fund is really, really important if this is going to happen and the sooner it's developed the better. Now we already know that climate finance is robbing traditional ODA, I imagine this will start robbing those two funds, so it's an, it's an awkward and horrible situation to face, but we have to confront it. Because if we look after the most vulnerable, you're going to minimise the damage costs facing all states around the world and they'll be able to keep their states afloat and help to manage these problems. So the, the degree of interdependence is profound. Maxine, did yeah, you? Just very, just very quickly, I just wanted to affirm that the two comments, which is that um, particularly uh, the former president of Kiribati, um, Anote Tong, has been incredibly um, uh, forward-looking about the, the implications of, of loss of territory and has looked at a number of different ways of, of addressing the issue, uh, including st staying in place as well as having a backup plan as well as potentially having another um, lands to purchase. Um, also, it is absolutely true that there were prior concerns in the islands that were forcing movement and, and it might be interesting to note that one of the the only uh, migration efforts that was that sort of had more traction uh, during the Obama administration was that of the Bikini Islanders who had been moved from their islands for nuclear testing then the island that they were moved to was suffering such um, intense sea level impacts from sea level rise that they were then needing to move again, and that did have some traction under the in Department of Interior, uh, under the Obama administration. Um, I, I will say that even if there were, if there was a mega fund that was capitalized sufficiently to do all of what loss and damage needs to do, and especially climate migration is one element of it, um, that I do think that most people would, well, I think a lot of people want to stay home at, in their, their place of origin. That's been my um, understanding from what we know about immigration and migration. So uh, it, it, again, we would need to be thinking about how to keep the, their homes viable for as long as possible uh, and perhaps uh, maybe whether uh, a period of time, if we are to get our act together and get our emissions down, period, that period of time that will have uh, the most uh, intense impacts from climate change. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, next question. Okay. And could you please keep our questions brief, because time is running short. I'll keep it uh, brief then. I'll just uh, say the words response measures. You know, countries like East Timor and that are um, dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, people in the Pacific, tourism's a big industry. So if there's Corsia or what's other things that in increase airfares, um, is that included as that type of adjustment? Depends on capability and all those other re reasons. If I may. Um, it, it's a really good point about response measures. For those not familiar with the international jargon, response measures were provisions inserted in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change by particularly oil dependent states that said that parties had to guard um, for the impacts of their response measures, that is, their climate policies, on countries that were fossil fuel dependent. And that's the only place in the whole regime where fossil fuels are mentioned. So um, I think it's really important to put the, the costs of transition to oil for oil dependent countries in perspective alongside um, the impacts of climate change for the most vulnerable. And when you've got an impoverished country like East Timor, I think it's perfectly appropriate to look at the effect on their economy of response measures to phase out the purchasing of their oil or gas. Um, but when you look at corporations um, who stand to lose profitability and potentially go out of business, my heart does not bleed. And that's absolutely incomparable to the identity loss and suffering of, of vulnerable parties. So I think it's, it's about putting the, the interests of the most vulnerable forward. And so in a kind of transitional arrangement, because we're going to be in a permanent state of transition. This is why I'm reaching for transitional justice. Not necessarily in the sense of those that look at truth and reconciliation commissions, well, there, there may be room for those. It's more about this is a permanent condition. There's no end state, a green state. There's a constant political struggle 
to transit towards a fairer situation, both in minimising the risks and also managing them fairly. And so when you reach a point where you acknowledge that the cost to everyone have just become too high, that's the point where you have an opening in a space to have a critical conversation, but with critical limits to it that will protect the vulnerable so you don't give up those rights, where their potential power to litigate can be a bargaining tool. And, I think, and it can be backward-looking, where you have acknowledgement and memorialisation, those sorts of things, forward-looking, where you're trying to draw on the most capable and, and not always play the blame game because that can be politically productive and produce a very defensive reaction. But when you've got a country like East Timor, I'd say absolutely. Response measures and their effect on East Timor mean we need to think about other ways of compensating or dealing with East Timor's loss of income being such an impoverished country. But when it comes to the oil majors, I'll say, well, let them go down the gurgler. OK. Um, Maxine, did you have anything to add? OK, I think we've got time just for one last uh, question before we have to finish. So anyone like to ask it? Thanks, uh, Etam Jan from KTH. Uh, well, thanks for these stimulating talks, and particularly to follow up on the idea of mega fund. Um, I think we have a real life analog on, on the potential mega fund uh, on the ongoing Syrian refugee crisis, uh, which is the very shameful EU Turkey deal, which, in which EU is paying Turkey 6 billion euros to keep refugees away. Um, and I have um, kind of a fear that such a mega fund may turn out to be a tool to keep refugees away, in particular enclaves as well. Um, because people like um, Alex Betts and Paul Collier from Oxford, so they've been suggesting these, uh, what I think as also very um, shameful suggestions of making exclusive economic zones to keep uh, refugees away uh, from the global north so that they can be uh, resided in the nearby countries in which, to which they migrate. So the question is, I mean, how would we ensure that such a mega fund in the case of climate refugees would not impede um, people's right to mobility to anywhere they wish, but kind of allow them to move as freely as possible? Thank you. Okay, that's a good question. I'd certainly like your... Do you want to start with that, Maxine? Um, that is a problem. We know that political refugees in, in the world are mainly languishing, languishing in developing countries on the border of the places from which they fled, um, awaiting resettlement that never happens. And there are, you know, th up to three generations that have lived in some of these resettlement camps in Africa. Um, so I think I really take all of your points very seriously. But at the end of the day, um, I think a lot of... Um, those who are forced to migrate internationally would want to stay in their region because of ties. But I, I mean, I don't want a second... I, I, I would like them to have the, the right to choose, and I've actually defended that um, because of the nature of the injustice. And if you've got a fund that equips them to move, then it does soften. I, it won't get rid of the potential hostility of host, state, host states because they've got the capability to do that. And so whether they choose a rich or a poor state, they're going to be able to manage if they're provided with the funds to do so. So the idea of encouraging them to stay in the South is pernicious, but they should have the choice to do that if they wish, and that's what I'm wanting to defend. And the fund, so a common responsibility to receive, a right to choose, and a differentiate, resp differentiated responsibility to assist to the fund to enable all of that. That's the kind of the, the sweet spot which is a long way off, I have to say, but I think it's, a, it's how we should think about it. Yeah, that's right. I want to underscore how, how sort of far uh, sort of in the, on the horizon that would be if we um, are able to do a whole host of things in the interim, which is allow for this issue to be one and that is taken seriously in the negotiations and become a core part of any instrument at this point um, and have, you know, has parameters that are clearly um, articulated. What we know at this point is that uh, there is constantly this tension between what human rights might suggest, which is more of an individual right, and what the obligations are that countries um, use to exercise or, or to meet the, the needs of those who are, um, who are claiming those rights. And that's where we see that gap, I think, in, in whether it's a mega fund or any sort of formal structure. Um, the, the funding would come much, well after there being some clear understanding of how we would orchestrate these kinds of, um, of moves. And 
it's likely that there would be a clear rights argument that would not allow for this kind of exclusionary policy. Uh, again, compliance becomes an issue. How do you get a state to respond to that effectively? Um, and again, all of these pr proceed, this is antecedent to whether or not there's money for it and the, whether or not the fund itself could, uh, could facilitate this, these kinds of inclusionary policies. So I, I would just like to say it's inchoate, but I, the articulation of those obligations or the need to have clear understandings between the state and those that are moving is at the beginning of the conversation and we are at a point of needing to really push that conversation um, out of the sort of academic realm and more forcefully into the the, the realm of, of negotiation um, and transformative um, policy frameworks. Okay, um, unfortunately we'll have to finish there, so um, thank you again Maxine and Robin. <laughs>